Greetings one and all, this is Guthrie Govan here and welcome to my exciting new column about string bending. I think the important thing about string bending is it's something that's kind of uniquely awesome when you apply it to the guitar. You can use your string bending prowess to taunt the piano players of the world because try as they might, they can't do it at all. And it's a very nuanced, subtle thing and there's all sorts of different aspects you can explore. So I thought just for this first instalment, we'd start by looking at everyone's best friend, the minor pentatonic scale, and just systematically trying to find all the bending fun that you can have within this very well-known scale shape. So I propose that we start with something painless. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the A minor pentatonic scale, right? I think most of our noble viewers will have heard or seen that somewhere before. Um, a very, very popular scale. Um, and I think the first kind of bend that we should look at is just the, the microtonal bend, uh, partially because it's, it's a kind of uniquely bluesy flavor and partially because it's not gonna hurt too much. Um, so if you're in the key of A minor, the one that I just established moments ago, there are certain notes that you can squeeze slightly sharp, uh, not even up to the next semitone, just slightly sharp and it, it'll make you sound more bluesy and authentic. Um, the best notes to start with there would be the minor third and maybe the minor seventh. So if you're in the key of A, your minor third will be any note bearing the name C, and the flat seventh would be any note that's G. And hopefully you can hear the difference if I play the same lick twice, once just playing the notes completely flat and lifeless and without conviction, and then again squeezing these notes a little bit. Um, so the, the dull version of the lick might be something like... Uh, clearly I don't have the blues. But now, uh, same thing, but... To me, that sounds a lot more like the real thing, even though that's not a real note. You can't find it on the piano keyboard. It doesn't exist. It's hiding between a white key and the black key next door. Uh, but the way to make these work is just to listen to how far you're bending it. Um, looking at the fretboard won't help you at all. And the other thing is, you're telling a story every time you do one of these mi uh, microtonal bends. You're starting with the note at its correct pitch, according to music theory of the West, and then you're squeezing it into this special place where bluesiness lives. And that has to be the end of the story. Once the pitch has reached that special bluesy sweet spot, it's important that you can cut the note off. So the last thing people hear of that note is that flavor. If you let it back down again, and that's what your fretting hand wants to do, it wants to bend and then release, you lose a lot of the impact. It's gotta be. So you need to explore different parts of your hands to find some convenient part of piece of flesh, if you will, that's not doing anything else. So that you can cut that note off and stop it ringing whilst it's still slightly bent. Uh, it sounds like such a trivial little thing, but it makes all the difference. So you could take any blues lick you know anywhere on the neck and just find out where the flat third and the flat seventh are and try to focus on just squeezing those notes a little bit sharp. And hopefully it will make you sound a bit more like the real thing. So everyone's favorite shape is here. Or maybe this one, most people know. At least that half, that's Albert King country right there. Um, so like this bend. Or you can move up to this position. Or this one. I couldn't help myself there. I started to do some bigger bends, 
I'm sorry, but we were coming to that. Once you've got yourself comfortable with all the microtonal inflections, I think it's a good time to start exploring more melodic bends, if you will. And by melodic bend, I mean one that takes you from one scale note up to the next note that's available in the scale. So some of these will hurt. So I'm going to relocate from A minor up here to say E minor. And uh, I think most of us are familiar with the, the common bends in like uh, this one, this one. But there are actually 12 melodic bends that you can do in that area. And the way to explore this is just to take the lowest note in the scale and then figure out what the next legal note in the pentatonic framework is. It'll be that one. And then try to bend this one up to the same pitch. And then just continue through the whole scale in that fashion. So this note, your goal would be to bend up to that note. And around here, maybe you'll start to encounter bends that hurt that little bit too much. And I would contend no one is going to give you a medal for using your first finger all, all on its own to bend that note up one and a half tones. Um, you'll hurt yourself needlessly and no one really cares. All that matters is the way it sounds. Um, because we're not playing Flight of the Bumblebee or I Am a Viking or anything like that, you have time to sneak down and maybe use two fingers instead of one. And then your fingertips just live longer. And so. Now, what's left? This one. This is the most painful one of the whole lot. Apologies to the Stevie Ray devotees who have a set of 13s. That one is maybe not achievable, but it's still worth exploring, if only so you can cross it off your list of possibilities and never try to bend that note in front of a paying audience. So you can do that for all five pentatonic boxes. It's the same principle, just listen to the pitch of the next note up and then try and match it with your bend. Um, so I guess the next step is to test your memory. And this is a tactile kind of memory. You're trying to memorize how much each of these bends hurts when you're doing it right. So for this next approach, the idea is to pre-bend. So um, instead, of, instead of that, we're just going to go straight to this and guess the pitch. Um, this would be a good time to have some kind of chordal backing going on just so that you have a reference point for your pitching. So if I play a song called E minor, Okay, E minor, and now when I play this bend, you know immediately if you're doing it wrong, or if you're doing it right. That's enough E minor, you get the idea. So. What I would propose is that you just explore your blues scale shapes and try and incorporate a few new legal bends into your existing vocabulary, and you'll find that it can transform a lot of your existing licks. Um, if you're already the kind of player who likes, likes to do something like that, maybe just having the confidence to use these pre-bends will help you to turn that, turn that into... Just adding a little flavour, a different way to start or end a lick, and it becomes something you can use immediately in your own playing. So have fun, use these bends wisely, and perhaps I'll see you next time.
Cheers.